Max Lankai, welcome to the Pacey Performance Podcast. It's an absolute pleasure to have you. Thank you. The pleasure's all mine. Appreciate Thank you for getting up early. Thank <laughs> you for getting up early. I appreciate it. Yeah. Coffee's in. Coffee's Breakfast's coffee's in. in. Sorry, say again. Breakfast done. Breakfast done. Oatmeal. Or for, for you uh, UK people, porridge. Porridge. Yes. Yes. Excellent. Well, anyone doesn't know who you will we'll dive into your background, your, I suppose, your, the traditional side of your past. But there's lots of stuff going on there with how you got to where you got when we first met in 2018, which was in Nuremberg. And there's, a, I think there's a fascinating build up to that. And much like only a few people that I've had in the podcast, Fergus Connolly comes to mind with his computer maths based background. We've got uh, Dan Cleaver from his finance background. You've got an interesting one that I've never had on the podcast before. Briefly touch on that and then we'll dive into your more traditional past. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, I guess. I, I can only imagine that you're referring to my, um, you know, stint in the entertainment industry. Of course. Of course. Yeah. So yeah, when I when I finished school, I um, I worked uh, in a morning show or for a morning show on the radio. After that, I thought, what's next? So I studied acting. Um, from acting, I didn't take too much time on stage. Um, then coached actors. Inherently a coach deep inside me. So I I, I you know realized that very early. And um, then from that, essentially went on to, instead of coaching actors and being fed up with the entertainment industry, as we can all potentially now relate on with all the news that, you know, have been coming out uh, in the past one or two years. Yeah, that's how crooked that industry is, um, pardon my French, um, and went on to, you know, the results driven world of coaching, which is then obviously um, sports. So um, nice. Very brief. But um, that's yeah. how I got where I am uh, in regards of in regards of that. Yeah, didn't want to miss it though. Of course. Um, so we met in 2018, Nuremberg, Bundesliga two. Correct. But you'd been in you'd been coaching for a year or two before that with St. Pauli. Correct. The academy. Okay. But I don't think I know anyone, and we know each other reasonably well, or have come across anyone who's had a rise like you've had in our industry from being an SNC coach in Bundesliga 2 in 2018 to director of high performance in the MLS in 2022? How'd you get that job in 2021? No, I got it in, I inherited it in 2022. Yeah. 22. So in four years going from SNC coach to director of high performance. And I think that is well, it is going to be what how we frame the next 45 minutes because I think there'll be plenty of people out there who want to take that trajectory. They want to increase their impact, they want to increase their influence. Two words that we'll we'll dive into today. But I'd love to go back to that St. Pauli and Nuremberg time and just see how you did those two things or try to do those two things, maybe the barriers that came up against when it comes to having impact and have an influence. Yeah. A very good summary. Thank you very much, uh, uh, by the way. I've, I've never looked at it that way, um, the, the trajectory, but um, I guess. So uh, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it almost feels un, unreal, like the amount of things that have been going on in, you know, that if you look at the lifetime, that, uh, you know, brief stint of, of a life. Um, so going back to those St. Pauli days, which is, I loved. So I guess what I have to say is like, I used to have my, my own um, gym back then or my own performance facility, whatever you, you may call it, you know, give it a fancy name and, you know, it might, it might sell better. But was the... it, was it, was it Lankite performance? <laughs> no. See, good. This, good. I learned, good. <laughs> this I learned very early from a very smart man um, that we all know. Mike Boyle, who always said, if there's one thing I could change, it's taking my freaking name of the business I run because everybody always wants to meet the person whose name is on the, on the sign. Um, so Eric, Eric, Eric Cress, sorry to interrupt Max, but Eric Cressy wrote an article probably about a year ago, maybe a little bit less yeah. of his biggest mistakes. And number one was 
putting his name on the on the business. And I regret not that I'm comparable to Eric Cressy or Mike Boyle, but I I was pleased with myself for naming the podcast Pace Performance for about 48 hours. And after that, I was like, ah, oh, what am I doing? Sorry, yeah. carry on. No, it but, wasn't Lankite Performance. No, thank Good God. Move. I mean, <laughs> that's just one component. I don't even want to know. Not, oh, you don't even want to know what mail I get every single day where my name is written. Uh, or spelled wrong so that's a whole different component there you don't want that in the business as well anyhow so um so st pauli uh, had their um academy players train um at our facility and um, at some stage it just uh, asked me if i wanted to jump jump uh, a ship and go on full time and uh, i really enjoy and i still do player development um so it was an, an easy an easy sell for me business was running well so Potentially, my employees were happy that I'm not there. Um, so I went to St. Pauli. And the great thing with this club is, I guess, even the perception of it um, worldwide, potentially, is it, it's a very unique club. And I will still say that I've all the clubs that I've worked in so far um, in my career, they're different to this club or the other way around, right? So and it's, I think, in general... What I learned there is the impact of, of, um, you know, team versus individual. So, um, and really focusing on that aspect and also being resourceful, if that makes sense. Because I think they live, even if you could, for example, you know, whatever, buy two medicine balls. You don't do it because you want to embrace the fact that you need to you know, um, be a creative for what you have, right? And overcome a challenge to still get the stuff done that you need to get done in order to achieve something without necessarily having what you want, if that makes sense. Mm. Um, and I thoroughly enjoyed uh, uh, that. And I, again, a lot of those those people that I worked with back then are still there. And, and that's also testament in our very high volatile and you know high turnover world that shows something and it's it's and i think that was something that i learned quickly there as in how can i be impactful without having anything um and by essentially relying also on all the people around you rather than um you know on on yourself so that was great you know we had we had, um, you know, one field, one training field at the same time sharing with three different teams, for example, right? Um, how do you now, you know, um, do certain things? We didn't have a gym. What are you going to do? You know, and so on. So it's, it was, it was great. It was a great, uh, um, time to just learn at the beginning of a career, right? Because that's all coming back now. You're like, okay, you know, what, what do you do when you don't have anything? Because I guess that's what most of the people are experiencing in all the clubs around the world. Like you don't have anything, maybe a couple of rubber bands if you're lucky, right? So how are you going to achieve, you know, sprint work? How are you going to achieve, you know, hypotrophy, whatever it is? Um, so yeah, and from, from there, uh, had a quick stint, um, at Exos, um, in between, uh, back then even the athletes performance and, um, and then went to Nuremberg and in Nuremberg, that's when you and I met and I quickly realized because of the situation in the in the club, um, my original position, uh, or let me put it this way, like my position was there twice. So essentially, one of us had to find something else to do in order to not be redundant, right? Um, so my colleague then did all the on-field um, stuff, if you will, you know, like the warm up and, and so on, and and the even in the gym, the programming. And I then quickly found, okay, how can I, to your point earlier, how can I have an impact now? How can I be influential without being, you know, looked at as oh, he's just there and essentially is a mini me of of the other person. So in that case, you know, you look you look at your environment, and go like, what is missing, right? So you're there and you're trying to find, you know, something that potentially other people have been missing. What's missing to make this program complete, right? So in that case, there was a lot of strength conditioning going on. Um, 
but there wasn't anything in regards of, you know, training load management or a proper return to performance, return to, um, you know, sport, whatever people may call it in their environment um, uh, program. So a methodology, if you will, philosophy even. So I quickly then realized, okay, what what is the most impactful thing that I can do here? I can essentially function as the liaison between the um, medical staff, which in Germany traditionally, at least back then, was very much you know separated from um, strength and conditioning or what's happening on the field during training or from the coaching staff, technical staff. Um, so I kind of like went back and forth. So I deliberately then put my desk into um, your or next to the the physios rooms and was working there. So I can have conversations with them. I understand uh, what they're facing uh, um, with when they, you know, uh, work on the players and so on. And then I was able to kind of like translate certain messages over to the coaching staff. And then obviously also on that note, from the coaching staff back to that uh, physio room. And by this, I was essentially increasing the efficiency of things, as well as understanding how we can now translate or transfer players from an injury into what we're actually trying to achieve on the field, right? So back then, that was something that, you know, I may have heard of and I may have read of from very intelligent and smart people around the globe, right? But I've never like really embraced it or trying to really understand, okay, how do they actually do it? And that way, like hands-on, I experience what works, what doesn't work, what are the objections I'm facing, and so on, right? So that was, that was I think, how I kind of like got quickly into that impactful um, position there at Nuremberg. And then on that, because I built a certain amount of trust as in, okay, we can progress players now through the rehab phase uh, much quicker than before. Um, how can we now even increase um, or decrease, to, to, to use a better term, the um, injury prevalence with actually non-injured players? Okay, now let's just use that reverse engineer, like the training um, monitoring or the training load management of those return to performance players. And now what is it that actually our guys are doing that are healthy? And now we can potentially say like, oh, I think we need to reduce this and that person because I think he's doing too much opposed to, you know, what he should be doing, right? Um, and using then those injured players as a negative benchmark, if you will, right? So again, okay, what are the different stages? So I think that's something that, number one, was necessary in the club environment that I was in, but also it helped me essentially to learn on the job. So it was, as, I guess, as good for the club as it was for me personally. And I think to go back to your very first um, question about, you know, the trajectory, like within those couple of, of uh, years, I think that's the main thing where, where you need to find something where you personally, in, in that case, professionally, right? So it's now in that case, the same thing, as well as your club will benefit from. So the development, if you, are, if you can align both, Right. I think then it's just a matter of time um, that you progress because you you identify things that are important for either side. And then it's a win win situation. Um, and I think then it's also very easy to find the next step. For yourself. In order to make the jump to a next club or to a different position. Right. I think. Um, I'm a big Billions fan, the the um, the TV show, and I just recently, and I'm paraphrasing, it's not exactly the quote, but one quote was, sometimes it's it's more dangerous to stay too long than it is to leave early. Everybody who's been at a party at 4 a.m. knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> so. But I think the same rule applies to the real world. So that that quote really resonated uh, with me because obviously that's sometimes in conversation that comes up. Hey, you know, you you moved um, 
quite often, you know, um, and often it's always relative, but I think it's for oneself to identify what do I want? What is my ultimate goal? And how do I get there the quickest? And if then there's an opportunity where you're like, okay, I have this knowledge gap, I have this skill gap, I have this mindset gap, whatever it is, but, um, and this, this position is something that I can, uh, uh, that helps me to fill this void. That's, you know, an opportunity that you don't want to miss. However, on the other way, it's also oftentimes, especially in, in today's world, I have the feeling you need to be very, deliberate about it because also people do not want to face too many challenges. I also have the feeling they're shying away. You know, you see that in, in the amount of breakups people have with their partners, right? As long as everything is going well, oh yeah, you know, we love each other so, so much. But the moment the first challenge arises, you know what? I think it doesn't work out. You know, let's just break up. They're like, hmm. So, that's why you really need to be deliberate about your choice and go like, if there's still something that you can learn in your current position that you think is beneficial for you, or it's just because you're afraid or you, uh, you know, face adversity, then don't. Right. So I, I think that is the, that is the key, key for me to knowing what to do. In my case, I always, not always, that's wrong. But I think I just was lucky enough to make the right choices. Um, to then jump to the next opportunity rather than to stay longer and get potentially even better at, at the certain thing that I'm doing right now. Does it make sense? Yeah, 100%. There's loads of questions off the back of that. But one in particular, one little anecdote. When I spoke to Nick Winkleman <clears throat> a while ago and we talked about his transition from athletes performance or exos whatever it was at the time to irish rugby and he spoke of a checklist of what what he wants from his particular role i don't know how many points it was eight or ten and there was some missing okay but if there's some missing there that doesn't mean we jump ship can i plug them with external things is it a education thing okay my job my, my current role is not offering me this but can i get that elsewhere and then doing the maths and going, okay, these are critical and these are missing in the job. I can't get them elsewhere. My next step is, unfortunately, I'm going to have to go. And that was his process around around that. And I thought that was quite interesting and probably in line with what you were saying. But just to bring a, a question back to you, when it was identifying where the gaps were, I think that's really important for people. Did you identify the gap and say to your the people around you, is it okay if I do this? Or did you say, I've identified this gap, I'm going to fill it with this? Which way did you go about, because obviously they're very different things and can create two very different dynamics moving forward. How did you approach that? It's a very good question. And I, I don't think that I have an absolute answer to that. I think it, it's really dependent on, like you mentioned, the people around you. I think in general, what I try to do is, is asking people essentially the question is, Hey, um, this is an observation of mine. Did you have that observation as well? Right. Number one. They said, like, no, but that's interesting. Tell me more. Or how do you come about that? You instigate the conversation. And then down the line, you go, like, okay, listen, how about this? I make this case study. Um, and then we'll see how that, how that pans out. And you tell me if, if, or we can then decide whether we want to, you know, implement that in, in a broader scheme, right? Um, the other option is depending on how much, because that depends on the relationship you have with the person. Right. So if you don't have a good relationship or even access to certain individuals, I guess that's where everything starts. Sometimes you just don't have access, you know, as a whatever. Let, let's let's face it. If you're the academy strength coach for the U14s, um, for argument's sake, right, then your access to your CEO or your sporting director or your GM is potentially quite limited. Um, so. 
you don't necessarily have that. But on the other hand, so you can't ask that question, but on the other hand, all the eyes are also not on you. So in that case, you come up with your own hypothesis and then you create that case study yourself, right? And go like, okay, let me now disprove, to use, you know, scientific language, um, as a lot of your listeners um, obviously have a very, um, you know, broad scientific background, go like, okay, this is the hypothesis, now I'm going to disprove um, what I think is is correct, right? And I hope I'm wrong, <laughs> because that means that I was right. So, um, and then you have something to present, which then increases, once again, your leverage or your um, impact, and then potentially gives you the initial access to the people that then decide, oh, look at this guy, he can do that. So why not, you know, have him do X? Um, so does it answer your question? Yeah, absolutely. And I've written down <clears throat> down here, Google's 20% time, which I think kind, yeah. of, kind of links in with this, which I, I'm, I'm sure loads of people have read about that and how many things had spawned out of giving people that time to work on their individual projects. And that's kind of what we're talking about here is, and just remove your situation with the at Nuremberg, but giving people that opportunity to work on things that they've seen. Okay, I think there's a gap there. Let, let me spend a little bit of time on that, present this, and it might be a gap that lots of people are seeing to be able to plow forward and that, that little project be, becomes the your project or the practitioner's project to, to push forward and that becomes their thing. I think that's quite, a, <clears throat> if you have the opportunity within an organization to allocate that little bit of time maybe not 20%, but that bit of time to identify the gap, produce something and, and present it. No, I think you're right. Um, just also, I know I'm, I'm a dick now, but it's Google's 20%. But, you know, the, the original company that came up with this was 3M. Okay. So I think 3M should always be mentioned. Um, you know, credit where credit is due. Of course. Google was just very good in... You know, Marketing. taking things. <laughs> By the way, that's how every good practitioner should be. You know, learning from from what worked for others and then plugging it in. So anyhow, but I think this is this is a very critical thing. And if there's one thing about our industry that or our work environment in general, I think now having that many years of experience in the even you know across across the globe, I think. We are not allowed to have those 20, 20% 20 extra to be innovative because to be innovative and to do um, additional things, you have to have slack, right? Um, and oftentimes, you know, we have so much work, just task relevant work that we can't spend and allocate extra time, you know? Um, so this being said, I think what looks like a four year from 18 to 22, or I think five years now in total, but looks like a short amount of time is the fact that I also, I think I had my work day and then I did extra work. So I think, but to be successful in this industry, and I'm not saying you have to do it, right? It's always a choice. But I also think like in Nuremberg, I worked the first team in the morning and I worked the academy in the evening. So I was essentially there from 7 a.m. until 9 p.m. every single day, um, which gave me the exposure, which gave me the experience, which gave me all of these things. I didn't do it because people were demanding it, right? But I did do it because it was the only way for me to you know, work on certain things or experiment with with certain things. So, and I'm not saying that I'm awesome in this case. I'm just saying like five years might look short, but I think, you know, if you think about certain individuals and I'm by far not the only one, right? In those five years, potentially, you know, we worked 10 years worth of time. Um, so I think that is something that is, that is critical, uh, um, that if it's something that you're passionate about, nobody will pay you for this, but your your um, your payment will be, or the reward will be that you're getting better at what you do and you're learning so much. And this will always, you know, 
quoting Benjamin Franklin, right? We'll always pay the best interest. Um, and that's also how you know that you're passionate about what you're doing, like period. Then you know, okay, I think I have no other choice but doing this for a living because that's who I am. Um, so I think that's that's the component there. So I think in our regular, whatever, nine hours of work that we allocate, unfortunately, as much as I would like to have those 20 or 30% of Slack, I think maybe two out of um, 20 practitioners in our industry will actually have that time to do yeah. that. I agree. Let's fast forward a little bit to the the maybe not fast forward, but the, the, the transition or the changes that were happening in 2018 when we first met to, to 2022. Was the was the journey to a director of high performance always was that always the path you wanted to go? Because again, like I said, there be plenty of practitioners out there who want to make that accelerated transition, that transition over a 10 year period. But was that always the plan for you? And if so, what kind of things were you thinking about to make that happen in that time? I, I'm ahead of time. <laughs> um, I think when I started, I didn't necessarily, like as in the St. Pauli days, I didn't necessarily have that that goal in mind. But I think the moment... I um, was in Nuremberg. Um, I think that's where I realized this is where I want to um, be. And inherently, we're in a goal and results driven industry, right? So practice what you preach. So, you know, if you want to win a title, if you want to be successful as a player, you need to put in, you know, the work, you need to put in the hours, you need to put in the dedication, you need to 24 um, 7 live for it. Um, Talent doesn't bring you that far, right? Um, so, and I think that's the same thing then for, or was the same thing for me, like the moment, that's why I elaborate on the Nuremberg situation so much. I think that's where I realized, I think, I think I want to be in the seat to run my own program with my own philosophy. And the position seems to be director of performance, right? Because your eyes go, you know, obviously around the world, go like, okay, what, what is, what is a, what is similar? What, so who are those people that seem to have that amount of influence or seem to have that power or seem to have that, um, you know, say to run a program? And then you end up with, you know, people like uh, Joycey or, or, or Dave Tenney, um, um, just to, to name two, or, or Darcy Norman, for example, right? So you got to go, okay, they are in those seats and what are they doing? So, and then you reach out and to them and, and you know, that's, that's the, the grace or the beauty about mentorship as well as in, and then you learn about that. Okay. What do you have to do? Right. So you ask the question, what do I need to what Just like you just did. Right. So you have the goal. This is what I want to do. They tell you, these are just like your, um, like Nick's list. I actually spoke about him back then as well about exactly that journey as well. And then, and, and he was talking about impact. Um, so, which is funny. So again, like, okay, these are the 10 things apparently that, you know, Dave, Joycey, Darcy, Nick all agree on uh, to have in that position. Okay. So let me now start filling my gaps. And then, like you said, okay, maybe it is an educational course that I need to do. Okay. Maybe I need to learn more about management. Maybe I need to learn more about um, speed work. Maybe I need to learn more about um, manual therapy, right? In order to understand all of these components, to be able to actually create a holistic player-centric um, program um, in the end, which you will hopefully be allowed to do once you're in a position like that. Um, so I think, yeah, make a long story short, that's that's, that was the goal, and that's the. I think it's the only way it works. If you don't have a goal, there's nothing that you can achieve because you don't know what you're actually working towards. To. I don't want to put you in a difficult position here, but and please take time to ponder this. <clears throat> you you wanted you wanted more influence. You wanted to run a program. 
you're running a program now. Do you have have you able been able to have the influence on the program in a way that you thought you might do when you started thinking about this in 2018, 2019? Good question. Because just to, just to give you extra time, again, there'll be plenty of people who have the same thought, frustrated because they haven't got um, say over budget and they want to buy something they think is important for a, for a, for the for the gym, for example, or they want to change something in the program that they just don't have the say over changing. So they want that influence. They want to move up the chain. But once you're there, because you're there now in the position that many people would would love to have or think they would love to have is is it are you getting the influ- are you having the influence do you have the influence that you thought you would do well yes and no or it depends <laughs> also um you know the number one feared answer of all podcasts <laughs> um, it absolutely the, is. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think what you realize at some stage, to quote Viktor Frankl, right, free will doesn't exist. And I think the point is there's always somebody or something that prevents you from doing 100% what you want to do, right? Um, private life, business life, whatever it is, you know, like I'm pretty sure if you want to go on a bike ride and your daughter is sick, you go like, okay. <laughs> so, right? And the same thing is here as well, as in you go up, you think like, oh, I'm, you're, you're a sports scientist, um, you know, for for um, the first team, you go like, oh, the head strength conditioning coach, you know, he he prevents me from doing X or he doesn't like my ideas or she, them. Um, so, and then you become the head and conditioning coach and then realize, oh, the head coach doesn't like that, right? Then you potentially director and then all of a sudden the GM tells you, mm, doesn't work. Then you're the GM and then all of a sudden you realize, oh, there's a board. <laughs> and the board tells you and then the board, you're a board member and then the board member realizes, Okay, until I convince the owner of this club, also no chance. So there will, and potentially the owner, you know, um, reports to uh, their spouse <laughs> or their children. Yes. Right? So what I'm, what I'm saying, they, sure. you know, whatever. I get it. Yeah, so, yeah. so I think this is like you're chasing, you're chasing something that doesn't exist. Um, so you find those pockets of comes down to this, you know, and I hate to say this because it's been said so many times, control what you can control um, or focus on what you can control. So so you try to, okay, what is what is it that I can really influence here? Because perfection as such or an ideal world doesn't exist. Otherwise, you know, we would still be, you know, running around, uh, um, you know, naked potentially and, 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 and not eating apples. The so I think that's that's where the real critical moment is is in number one realizing the fact that at some stage it's a fight against windmills so why fight at all but then it's also about building those relationships and building that understanding of okay if I do X I can get closer and maybe if i do x as a result i'm also able to do y which i'm not able to do right now but then that x creates that leverage for me to do y which you know then um so it's kind of like a little bit like this um and and i think that that is the that is the critical point here that that you you will find things that you can do and you will find things that you want to do um, despite adversity um, and I think this is this is the the point is in what 
which is why philosophy is so important. Right? We all want, you know, everything. But then again, what is the, what task um, or what action or uh, what component has the highest leverage to get me closest to what I want to do in my, with my program? Right? Does that answer uh, Yeah, the 100%. I mean, the thing that I always come back to because it's my situation is, is self employment. Oh, your own boss. No, I'm not my own boss. <laughs> I just work for, I don't have one boss. I just have multiple bosses. And if you're selling, like the the recent um, course with Alex, Itometric course with Alex, I have hundreds, like thankfully we've got lots of bosses because lots of bosses have come on and taken the course and now we're answerable to them, whether it's good or not and whether they want their money back or not. So it's this, this, this myth of be your own boss. Just, it does make me, it does make me laugh. It's just, yeah, it's a lot more stressful than having just one boss a lot of the time. Yeah, and that keeps us on our toes, to be to be honest as well, because it it once again helps us hopefully to reflect on is it actually something that I want to do or that I have to do, right? So only because I think oh this is how the program looks like now I get some you know pushback because of various reasons, right? And sometimes it's just ignorance. You go like, okay, then let me let me reflect on this and, and let me maybe ask questions to really investigate if I should actually keep this part or if I should drop it or if I should change it. Because um, at the end of the day, there's always, as one of uh, our current players, very smart player um, told me the other day, there's always an opportunity. It's a, it's a mindset thing. Are you a fixed mindset? Or are you, you know, an, an open mindset? So I think I think that's that's don't close out. Um, it's just a chance for you to, you know, look at what you're doing and potentially changing things. Because nobody's opposed to change. Everybody wants to get better. It's just a matter of um, the message, right, and and the impl- implementation of it, and bringing people on board to make that change potentially. One thing that we've spoken about previously and has come up in various different podcasts of with people in your position is the development of systems, the, pro, the process has been put in place. And Jerry and Bettle, um recently on the podcast, we, we both, well, you know a lot more than I do, from uh, from New York or New York City, um, or used to be anyway, because I think he, re- I think he resigned about 24 hours after that podcast, or announced that he was leaving 24 hours after that podcast. Um, he was talking about exactly the same thing. I know that your two positions were slightly different, but I'd love to get to know a bit more the practicalities and some examples of the systems and processes that someone of in your position wants, has put into place or would like to put into place, how you would go about that, just kind of bring that to life a little bit. Because I know it's often thrown around about process and systems, but yeah, bring it to life for us if you can. No pressure. I'll, mm-hmm. <laughs> I'll try. Number one, uh, Jess is, uh, you know, potentially one of the best um, that we ever had. Now we lost him. Um, but um, I'm sure he's very happy at what he does now. Um, so I'm I'm not comparing what what Jess has been doing in his you know 20 year career to what I'm doing or trying to do. Um, somebody that I aspire to be maybe one day. The um, I think about systems. I'm just trying to think how to to actually um, start this. I think. Systems are important because you need to look at it from a management perspective. As in when you, when you, and I'm not speaking from, from the current position I'm in. So if you oversee, you know, six teams, you know, uh, uh, almost a double digit amount of, you know, staff and they oversee then obviously players and so on. And then you have to, um, you know, communicate with coaching staff across across the board, systems make communication easier when you're not there, right? 
So I think a lot of the things now, it, it depends. So I guess it depends on what problem are you trying to solve, right? So I, I believe that like in our, in our world, we have three different types of problems. We have critical problems, we have um, wicked problems, and we have tame problems, right? Critical problems are crisis mode. So, which means you need to tell people what to do because there's no time for, you know, democracy as in, oh, what do you think? What do you think? What do you think? No, it's crisis. So you need to make a decision and then you need to make that work. And the person who's ultimately in charge in this case is me. So I make the decision and then, you know, you guys execute on this, please. Right. Because I am in charge and I will be held responsible for it. So let's make this work. So then there's those, um, you know, tame problems that you're talking about with which you can um, essentially solve with systems, standard operating procedures. Right. So which essentially means or management for that matter. Right. So which means, um, for example, there's a system to collect um, RPEs. Right. makes things easy. It's always the same. Right. You need to get RPEs. Okay. Let's create a system. It doesn't matter which age group you're in. It doesn't, doesn't matter, you know, who are the employees. It doesn't matter who's the head coach. This is what we're going to do. How can we collect RPEs? Right. Also, GPS, you know, how are we going to go about those GPS units? It's always the same in every team. And that's a procedure. It doesn't matter if we lose, you know, an employee or if a new employee comes in. This is the sheet of paper that tells you exactly what to do, right? So that's the system. It makes things easier without anybody having to explain anything, right? It's a standard operating procedure that has our system. And the same thing goes now if we go for um, the strength uh, um, training, for example, right? We have our system of progressions and regressions, okay? If somebody can't do that exercise, then regression number one is that exercise, it takes the thinking out because, and and the and the essentially, if you will, the the person out of the equation, which makes it again then transferable to an entire organization. But now, ultimately, we also obviously have those wicked problems, which are problems that you know are not happening again, if you will. So it's new problems, which is potentially the the biggest amount of problems we're facing. Um. Uh, um in our industry or in, in our profession, right? It's always something new. So in that case, you need to, like standard operating procedures don't help you because you, you need to ask democratically. So that's where diversity comes into play. You ask this person, this person, this person, what do you think, what do you think, what do you see? And that way we can come together and find potentially the best solution for that problem, um, if, if that makes sense. Because there is no known solution so far that we can translate into a a system right so um i think it, it depends on that moment and and from a people perspective i guess it's also then it depends on the which i call the task uh, a relevant maturity of a person right so if somebody is has a low task relevant maturity Right. Let's say he's, you know, just starting out in the industry and starts out as a, a strength coach for, for the academy, you know, then at the beginning, you need, you need to tell people what to do, when to do it and how to do it. And then they can come up with, oh, okay, if I do this and that and so on. Right. Because you need to trust the fact that you've done certain things and that you make those mistakes. So that person doesn't have to make those mistakes. But at the beginning, that's important. Then they kind of like, climb up the ranks of this or the, 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 the ladder in this task or maturity, right? Then you go to medium where then you kind of like, it's more like the coaching and support of an employee rather than systems. Okay. So because then it's kind of like, okay, you have all of this stuff in place, but now how can you get your own, um, you know, mind to it and make it a little bit your own. And then you coach people and like, oh, I have this challenge right now. Okay. And you support them, but you let them essentially, you know, uh, and solve the problems themselves. And then lastly, you have when there's the higher, uh, um, you know, task relevant maturity. And that's essentially where you go like, you know, this is yours. I'm not going to tell, you know, our, our, um, hedge line coach what to do. Right. I trust the fact that this is what we want to achieve in the end. And 
it's it's on you to achieve you know those objectives. I don't tell you how to do to do it because I know you're the best person for that for that task. I'm here if you need me, but this is the objective I want you to achieve. Um, and there you go. Have you, have you read the check, checklist manifesto? I should do. Not. It's good. It's good, and it, it it goes into some of the things that you just mentioned there about the standard operating procedures and some of the different professions that have checklists yes. as part of their daily life. Pilots, doctors, um, certain, mili- certain Pilot. military personnel. Like if you get if you have a little look in the cockpit, which we all do, we get on a flight. There's there's uh, ring binders with with checklists on that they go through every single time. So yeah. Could be uh, could be an interesting one for you. I read it a while ago. I highly recommend it. Highly recommend it. And something that I'm trying to implement, like I mentioned to you before we hit record, in, in setting up some of the processes that I'm trying to set up because I've got remote workers. So trying to, try to be yeah. clear on what I want because there's people in America or wherever um, who are doing work when I'm not working. So they have the necessary information that, that they need. And, and look, I think the, all those all those systems they get better by you know making mistakes. Like I think I failed so many times that that's how the systems that um, we're trying to incorporate um, you know improved over time because I did this and then ah oh, shit you know caused a huge bump in the road. They're like, okay, now let's adjust that system because it's not the only thing that changed was um, X, Y, Z or the thing that I ignored or was missing out on when I making when I made the system is X. So now let's incorporate that, which comes down to, you know, being being uh, open to to one's own failures. And, and I think that's the, that's the main thing right now as well. Like I'm trying to be honest when I, when I, you know, fuck I'm- up. And that happens. Hundred percent. Referring back to the book again, that is exactly refers to doctors and pilots. Like things happen, certain things change, and the checklist does not incorporate that into yeah. it. So it has to be a working document. It has to be developed. It has to be changed as the world moves on. And that's why also the more people use a system, the more often we get those moments for improvement. Right. So overall. It, the system will get better as well, I, I guess. Right? I mean, it comes down to leverage as well, like in, in regards of in regards of you know management as as well. You know, what is the highest impact that I can have with you know one action and one task, for example. You mentioned management there. We haven't got a lot of time left, but you mentioned management. You mentioned the two two words, leadership and management. Two words that are often used interchangeably. But for someone in your position, you're dealing with both. What do what does one how does one differ differ to the other? I think um, leadership is is um, about where to go, right? So it's about setting the strategy, you know, the 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 north star, if you will. Um, and and management is um, you know what to do to get there. So on that note, I think in today's world, and it's not only our industry, I think, is like leaders don't necessarily have to be good managers, but managers nowadays have to be good leaders. And that's also why I think those two terms are sometimes now used interchangeably because of that fact. Like, you know, who who can call themselves leaders? You know, like who is who is actually who is actually setting the strategy for an organization? Right? It's not necessarily the middle manager that I am. Right? Um, it's the board, or it's the CEO, or it's the owner. Right? And then. You try to align, and that's why I'm saying, like, okay, now it's on me as a, as a middle manager to align what we're doing to essentially achieve that objective. What is what is the what is the part that I can control? 
from a performance perspective in, in my case, right? That will help us to get there. Right. And that is, that is management translating this vision, if you will, right? Into objectives from a, from a um, department perspective, but then also from an individual perspective for each, um, you know, each team member and making sure that all of their objectives essentially align to the department objective because the department objective aligns to the over. And that's, I think, that's where management is the, what, what, or why management needs to be the focus for people, um, like me. Leadership is important, but I think we should not overestimate once again, the results driven objectives that we need to accomplish. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. Absolutely. So I think that's that's where it comes that's where that's where it comes in. And leadership is just then finding out, you know, what does a does a person potentially need, which like we like I said earlier, you know, what problem are we facing? Right? So now it's situational leadership, right? What what does my team, what does this individual, what do they need right now from me? Do they need me to step back? Do I need to bring everybody together so we have a democratic um you know, conversation about something? Do I need to tell somebody what to do? All in mind um, of the overarching, you know, vision of the club or, or our um, objective as a department, right? Um, putting into context, what am I facing right now from a personal perspective, right? Maybe somebody needs to get a day off, okay? That's management as much as the leadership, um, right? And, and, and I so know on. that you're doing from our previous conversations that you're doing an MBA. Why why an MBA and how much does it impact your day-to-day -day work in your current role? And what is the what is the what's the next goal for you? And is 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 the MBA a way to get to that next goal? Uh, yes, I can answer answer that. Um circling back to what we said earlier. You realize this, the moment you reach a certain goal, you go like, okay, and now what's next? So same thing is for me, you're a director of, uh, um, you know, performance. And then you realize, oh, I didn't think that I can't do X, or I didn't think that mm, in order to achieve this, actually, I would need to have that. So now the next step for me is like, definitely, you know, going on the, you know, management uh, side of things and leaving the, the, the umbrella of performance, if you will. And I know performance is a broad term anyway, but now going, you know, one step higher and then go, okay, I either want to become a GM, right? Or I want to be able to help people in my position to you know, be able to communicate more efficiently with their respective CEO, GM, sporting director, whatever, um, or become a GM themselves or the other way around, helping GMs to understand the needs and the challenges of people in my position. Because there is this disconnect that I realized across all of those years. And it's not, not the absence of respect. It's more the absence of not understanding what each of their respective roles are or each of their respective challenges are and how can we now merge those in order to create a more holistic and more, um, once again, player and results-driven environment where everybody can thrive because we have players on the field, but we also have players off the field, which then would be employees, right? So, and I think if you want to achieve that, you need to be able to speak their language, meaning the business language, and you need to be able to, um, to level head on their, on their side. And if I can't read a balance sheet, you know, it doesn't help me if I request, oh, I want this all to G, right? Cost 35K. It's a random number now. So going like, okay. No, we don't have that budget. 
give me that balance sheet. Let me have a let me have a, a you know look and let me see if I can um, you know now try to potentially you know um, look where we can save something or can I now do some entrepreneurial work in the performance department so we can generate some revenue that we can then use to buy our alter G. Um, and I'm not necessarily, you know, reliant on the money from up top because I generated it myself, you know. And then obviously the, the theoretical frameworks of management, theoretical frameworks of change management, like these are so important because it's something we're facing every single day in any club around the world. And I think when we're facing or we're, we're focusing too much on that leadership component, like on the word leadership and a vision is great right but we need to put things into action right we need to get people on board with a certain message with a certain a vision and and i think that's where oftentimes people get lost they're trying to do the right thing but then there's a certain methodology a certain practices a certain a certain developed frameworks that will help you to guide you on that way to achieve what you want to do, right? If you're, for example, coming into a club new as a head coach, as a GM, as a CEO, or as a performance director, okay? Maybe it's organization design. So maybe I need to restructure our department. Maybe I need to restructure, you know, um, even on a higher level, right? How do how does um, performance management work? As you know, um, for example, performance reviews, how can I tie rewards to um, objectives achieved and so on. So it's all of these components. And I think because there's so much, the MBA really helped me to get out of my own, you know, little um, world and expanding my horizon going, like, oh, yeah, if I would have had that, you know, three years ago, maybe, uh, you know, I would have not done that mistake. And I think I can... I can, there's not many, I guess, from, from the performance world that went on to become GMs, right? And some, like I said, I think there's, there's a disconnect between what we're trying to accomplish and why we're trying to accomplish it in the message that potentially um, a GM understands. Um, so there, there's bridging that gap is my next, um, my next uh, adventure. I would even call it adventure. A lofty goal, um, which I absolutely love. And I think that's a good place to, to wrap up. We've gone through the journey. We've gone through the journey and I'm, I'm, I'm keen to, uh, to follow along. But anyone that wants to get in touch about your journey, about just follow along, see when that GM tag comes next to your name on Twitter. Um, where's, the, where's the best place people to follow <laughs> along, Max? I think I'm um, most active or best reachable, let me put it that way, on, on LinkedIn. I think that's the, that's the best and easiest way to get in contact with me. Um, and I'm happy to engage in conversations uh, anytime to, to, you know, to connect. And there's so many people I can learn from out there as well. So please don't hesitate. It doesn't, you know, I can learn from people all, all across the bandwidth um you know in 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 our profession so it's not that i'm i'm only looking for of course. higher ups of course. No. love it right mate i'm gonna let you get on with your day now you've now you've woken up breakfast done coffee done podcast done happy days right mate thank you very much See you. speak soon really appreciate your time cheers buddy